Part Zero of A Child of the Jago by Arthur Morrison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. A Child of the Jago by Arthur Morrison. Part Zero. Title Page and Preface. A Child of the Jago. Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Because, even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar, say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall, there shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, great hailstones, shall fall and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? Ezekiel, chapter 13, verse 3, and verses 10 to 12. A Child of the Jago by Arthur Morrison, author of Tales of Mean Streets. Third edition, Matthew and Company, 36 Essex Street, W. C. London, 1897. To Arthur Osborne J., Vicar of Holy Trinity, Shoreditch. Preface to the Third Edition. I am glad to take this, the first available opportunity, to acknowledge the kindness with which A Child of the Jago has been received, both by the reading public, from which I have received many gratifying assurances that what I have tried to say has not altogether failed of its effect, and by the reviewers, the most of whom have written in very indulgent terms. I think, indeed, that I am the more gratified by the fact that this reception has not been unanimous, because an outcry and an opposition, even from an unimportant minority, are proofs that I have succeeded in saying, however imperfectly, something that was worth being said. Under the conditions of life as we know it, there is no truth worth telling that will not interfere with some hearer's comfort. Various objections have been made to a child of the Jago, and many of them had already been made to tales of mean streets, and it has been the way of the objectors, as well as the way of many among the kindest of my critics, to call me a realist. The word has been used sometimes, it would seem, in praise, sometimes in mere indifference, as one uses the phrase of convenient description, sometimes by way of an irremediable reproach. It is natural, then, not merely that I should wish to examine certain among the objections made to my work, but that I should feel some interest in the definition and description of a realist, a matter never made clear to me. Now it is a fact that I have never called myself a realist, and I have never put forth any work as realism. I decline the labels of the schoolmen and the sophisters, being a simple writer of tales, who takes whatever means lie to his hand to present life as he sees it, who insists on no process, and who refuses to be bound by any formula or prescription prepared by the cataloguers and the pigeonholers of literature. So it happens that when those who use the word realist use it with no unanimity of intent and with a loose, inapprehensive application, it is not easy for me, who repudiate it altogether, to make a guess at its meaning. Nevertheless, it seems to me that the man who is called a realist is one who, seeing things with his own eyes, discards the conventions of the schools and presents his matter in individual terms of art. For a while the schoolmen abuse him as a realist, and in twenty years' time, if his work have life in it, he becomes a classic. Constable was called a realist, so was Corot. Who calls these paintists realists now? The history of Japanese art affords a continuous illustration, from the day when Iwasa Matahei impudently arose and dared to take his subjects from the daily life of the people, to the day when Hiroshige casting away the last rag of propriety, adventurously drew a cast shadow in flat defiance of all the canons of Toza and Kano. In all this time, and through all the crowded history of the school of Ukiyo-ye, no artist bringing together something of his own to his art, but was damned for a realist. 
even the classic Harunobu did not escape. Look now at the work of these men, and the label seems grotesque enough. So it goes through the making of all art. A man with the courage of his own vision interprets what he sees in fresh terms, and gives to things a new reality and an immediate presence. The schoolmen peer with dulled eyes from amid the heap of precedents and prescriptions about them, and, distracted by seeing a thing sanctioned neither by precedent nor by prescription, dub the man realist, and rail against him for that his work fits none of their pigeonholes. And from without the schools many cry out and complain. For truth is strong meat, and the weakling stomach turns against it, except in minim doses smothered in treacle. Thus we hear the feeble plea that the functions of imagination is the distortion of fact the piteous demand that the artist should be shut up in a flower-garden and forbidden to peep through the hedge into the world. And they who know nothing of beauty, who are innately incapable of comprehending it, mistake it for mere prettiness, and call aloud for comforts. And among them that cannot understand, such definitions of the aims of art are bandied as to mean, if they mean anything, that art finds its most perfect expression in pink lollipops and gilt boxes. But in the end the truth prevails, if it be well set forth, and the schoolmen, groaning in their infinite labour, wearily write another prescription, admit another precedent, and make another pigeonhole. I have been asked, in print, if I think that there is no phase of life which the artist may not touch. Most certainly I think this. More, I know it. It is the artist's privilege to seek his material where he pleases, and it is no man's privilege to say him nay. If the community have left horrible places and horrible lives before his eyes, then the fault is the community's. And to picture these places and these lives becomes not merely his privilege, but his duty. It was my fate to encounter a place in Shoreditch, where children were born and reared in circumstances which gave them no reasonable chance of living decent lives, where they were born foredamned to a criminal or semi-criminal career. It was my experience to learn the ways of this place, to know its inhabitants, to talk with them, eat, drink, and work with them. For the existence of this place, and for the evils it engendered, the community was, and is, responsible so that every member of the community was, and is, responsible in his degree. If I had been a rich man, I might have attempted to discharge my peculiar responsibility in one way. If I had been a statesman, I might have tried another. Being neither of these things, but a mere writer of fiction, I sought to do my duty by writing a tale, wherein I hoped to bring the conditions of this place within the apprehension of others. There are those who say that I should have turned away my eyes and passed by on the other side, on the very respectable precedent of the priest and the Levite in the parable. Now, when the tale was written and published, it was found, as I have said, to cause discomfort to some persons. It is needless to say more of the schoolmen. Needless, too, to say much of the merely genteel, who were shocked to read of low creatures as Kiddo Cook and Pigeony Pole and to find my pages nowhere illuminated by a marquis. Of such are they who delight to read of two men in velvet and feathers perforating each other's stomachs with swords, while Josh Perrett and Billy Leary punching each other's heads present a scene too sickening and brutal to consider without disgust. And it was in defiance of the maunderings of such as these that Charles Lamb wrote much of his essay on the genius and character of Hogarth. But chiefly this book of mine disturbed those who had done nothing, and preferred to do nothing, by way of discharging their responsibility towards the Jago and the people in it. The consciousness of duty neglected is discomforting, and personal comfort is the god of their kind. They firmly believe it to be the sole function of art to minister to their personal comfort, as upholstery does. They find it comfortable to shirk consideration of the fate of the Jago children, to shut their eyes to it, to say that all is well, and the whole world virtuous and happy. And this mental attitude they nickname optimism, and vaunt it, exult in it as a quality, so that they cry out at the suggestion that it is no more than a selfish vice, and find in truth where they had looked for the materials of another debauch of self-delusion. They moan aloud. They protest, 
and they demand as their sacred right that the bitter cup be taken away from before them. They have moaned and protested at a child of the Jago, and, craven and bewildered, any protest seemed good enough to them, and herein they have not wanted for allies among them that sit in committee rooms and tinker. For your professed philanthropist, following his own spirit and seeing nothing, honestly resents the demonstration that his tinkering profits little. There is a story current in the East End of London of a distracted lady who, being assailed with a request for the loan of a saucepan, defended herself in these words. Kill your mother, I can't lend her the saucepan, consequence of having lent it to Mrs. Brown, besides which I'm a using of it myself, and, moreover, it's gone to be mended, and what's more, I ain't got one. In a like spirit of lavish objection, it has been proclaimed in a breath that I transgress. Because, one, I should not have written of the Jago in all the nakedness of truth. Two, my description is not in the least like. Three, moreover, it is exaggerated. Four, though it may be true, it is quite unnecessary, because the Jago was already quite familiar, and everybody knew all about it. Five, the Jago houses have been pulled down, and six, there never was any such place as the Jago at all. To objections thus handsomely variegated, it is not easy to reply with the tripping brevity wherewith they may be stated. And truly it is little reply that they call for, except perhaps, in so far as they may be taken to impugn the sincerity of my work and the accuracy of my picture. A few of the objectors have caught up enough of their wits to strive after a war in my own country. They take hold of my technical method and accuse me of lack of sympathy. They claim that if I write of the Jago I should do so even weeping. Now my technical method is my own, and is deliberately designed to achieve a certain result, as is the method of every man, painter, poet, sculptor, or novelist who is not the slave and the plaything of his material. My tale is the tale of my characters, and I have learned better than to thrust myself and my emotions between them and my reader. The cant of the charge stares all too plainly from the face of it. It is not that these good people wish me to write, even weeping, for how do they know whether I weep or not? No, their wish is, not that I shall weep, but that I shall weep obscenely in the public gaze. In other words, that I shall do their weeping for them, as a sort of emotional bedesman, that I shall make public parade of sympathy on their behalf, so that they may keep their own sympathy for themselves, and win comfort from the belief that they are eased of their just responsibility by vicarious snivelling. But the protest that my picture of the Jago is untrue is another thing. For the most part it has found very vague expression but there are instances of rash excursion into definiteness. Certain passages have been denoted as exaggerations, as impossibilities. Now I must confess that, foreseeing such adventurous indiscretions, I had, for my own diversion, set a child of the Jago with traps. For certain years I have lived in the east end of London, and have been, not an occasional visitor, but a familiar and equal friend in the house of the East Ender in all his degrees. For though the steps between be smaller, there are more social degrees in the East End than ever in the West. In this experience I have seen, and I have heard things that persons sitting in committee rooms would call diabolical fable. Nevertheless, I have seen them, and heard them. But it was none of my design to write of extreme instances. Typical facts were all I wanted. These, I knew, would be met, or shirked, with incredulity, so that, whenever I saw reason to anticipate a charge of exaggeration, as for instance in the matter of faction fighting, I made my typical incident in a cold transcript of a simple fact, an ordinary, easy-going fact, a fact notorious in the neighbourhood, and capable of any amount of reasonable proof. If I touched my fact at all, it was to subdue it, that, and no more. The traps worked well. Not one definite charge of exaggeration has been flung, but it has been aimed at one of the normal facts I had provided as a target. Not one. 
Sometimes the effect has had a humour of its own, as when a critic in a literary journal, beginning by selecting two of my norms as instances of palpable exaggeration, went on to assure me that there was no need to describe such life as the life in the Jago, because it was already perfectly familiar to everybody. Luckily, I need not vindicate my accuracy. That has been done for me publicly by independent and altogether indisputable authority. In particular, the devoted vicar of the parish, which I have called the Jago, has testified quite unreservedly to the truth of my presentation. Others also, with special knowledge, have done the same, and though I refer to them, and am grateful for their support, it is with no prejudice to the validity of my own authority. For not only have I lived in the East End of London, which one may do, and yet never see it, but observation is my trade. I have remarked in more than one place the expression of a foolish fancy that because the houses of the old Jago have been pulled down, the Jago difficulty has been cleared out of the way. That is far from being the case. The Jago, as mere bricks and mortar, is gone, but the Jago in flesh and blood still lives and is crowding into neighbourhoods already densely overpopulated. In conclusion, the plan and the intention of my story make it requisite that, in telling it, I should largely adhere to fact, and I did so. If I write other tales different in scope and design, I shall adhere to fact or neglect it as may seem good to me, regardless of anybody's classification as a realist or as anything else. For though I have made a suggestion, right or wrong, as to what a realist may be, whether I am one or not is no concern of mine, but the concern, if it be anybody's, of the tabulators and the water sifters. Arthur Morrison, February 1897 End of Part Zero Title Page and Preface